Christine Benz, a very warm welcome to the Humans versus Retirement podcast. Dan, it's so great to see you. So wonderful to be with you. Um, thank you so much for coming on. I can't wait for this conversation. Um, we've had a couple of, we, we, we were speaking just now for 10 minutes before, before we hit record. Um, and I'm delighted to say that both you and your husband are on your pre-retirement trip from Chicago, <laughs> which is blustery and snowy in Florida. So you're, you're dipping your toe in the uh, in, in your retirement journey. And I can't wait to kind of explore some of your personal takes on this um, as, as we go through this conversation. Yeah, Dan, it's, uh, you know, it's a working vacation uh, right now for us, but the idea is to experiment with, you know, how various aspects of retirement might feel and to do so while we're younger and, you know, before we make any irrevocable decisions. So that's kind of the goal of this, this little month long trip. Love it. Love it. I wish I had somewhere to do that over here. At the moment, <laughs> everywhere is cold and wet. So it doesn't matter where I drove to or where I flew to in, this, in, in the UK. But um, no, fantastic. Um, Christine, you, you are um, such a, um, an amazing force when it comes to your knowledge and writing around personal finance, particularly around the retirement space. Um, I was delighted to be on your podcast, The Long View, um, a, a few months ago. And the work that you've done throughout your career has been, you know, fantastic for, for, for us as uh, professionals and for the, for the wider public. Um, I'd love you just to spend five, five minutes, maybe too short, because it's been such a wonderful career, but five minutes or so talking about your journey, your background, and kind of how you find yourself where you are today. Sure. It's been a circuitous journey. I started um, at Morningstar shortly after college. I graduated from school with a double major in Russian language. So I studied Russian language for about 10 years. So Russian language and political science. Still am deeply interested in international relations and, and politics. It's uh, the tragic comedy of American politics is still a, a, a holds an abiding interest for me. But um, I wasn't especially employable, but I did apply at Morningstar on the suggestion of my dad, who was a um, an avid investor and a, a Morningstar user uh, back in the day and uh, started at Morningstar as a copy editor. So I was editing the analyst reports. And along the way, I became more interested in the substance of what I was editing and the investing aspect of what I was editing. So I became an analyst uh, covering mutual funds in the U.S., eventually headed up our U.S. fund research team, now called Manager Research, where we're analyzing individual mutual funds and exchange-traded funds, but along the way did uh, become more engaged with financial planning more broadly and began to think, well, you know, even though we're doing a great job counseling people on making good investment choices, there are a whole host of decisions that we're not addressing with our analyst hats on. So we're not talking about whether someone has a sane asset allocation. We're not talking about in retirement spending rates. A lot of the things that really make or break someone financially, we were not addressing as analysts. So I went through the Certified Financial Planner program here in the U.S., did the coursework at the time, um, which was sort of in the mid-2000s period. I would have needed to leave my job at Morningstar in order to earn the CFP letter. So I decided to not actually sit for the test, but um, just continue to pursue financial planning. And um, I remember there was one day where our now CEO, Kunal Kapoor, was head of Morningstar.com. And he said, you know, I want to hire someone, kind of a personal finance person, like a Susie Orman type to write for Morningstar.com. And I remember I was sitting across from him and I said, Kunal, it would kill me if you hired anyone besides me to do that job. Because by then I was realizing that it was more financial planning, personal finance that really lit me up, even though I, I still like the investment research. Uh, I, I felt like financial planning was my home and writing about financial planning and doing videos and, and speaking to, to groups. So really, I've been toiling in that general area ever since. And um, 
Morningstar has very nicely let me be sort of entrepreneurial, I would say, in that role. It's been a nice um, sort of best of, of both worlds in that I have been able to kind of build our brand and personal finance uh, and Morningstar has given me the resources to do that. So that's the distilled version. Um, now I'm part of a small research team at Morningstar uh, where we do research on portfolio construction, financial planning matters, retirement planning. So um, that's the, the distilled version of, of my work bio. Not only do you do wonderful research, but I think I, I don't know an organization or, or, or a team of people that that consistently produce and churn out amazing stuff, documents and research than you and your team. And 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 it's just um yeah, it's just absolutely phenomenal. And and I encourage anybody to 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 listening to kind of visit the site, have a look at the research, have a look at the the, the papers that, that are written because um, you know, I'm a big fan of evidence and, 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 and you guys at Morningstar bake everything. This is not kind of, you know, crystal ball hearsay stuff. This is <laughs> real life. What's going on research. You've got a great, um, pool to be able to pull from, i.e., you know, there's a lot of people that you can go to, to get this data, real life data. So yeah, it, it's a, it's a phenomenal run rate that you guys go at. Um, sometimes I think, how can you keep thinking of these things to go? But there's obviously a lot to lot to continue to do. Well, thanks, Dan. I, one thing, I, one thing I like about being out and speaking to actual investor groups is hearing their questions, and it gives me a sense of, oh, what what do people need help with? What are they confused about? And so that kind of provides the pipeline for what mm. what should what should we be working on next? Um, one thing that we've been thinking a lot about lately is just the long term care problem in the U.S. Um, mm. in that it's there's just no good solution. And I know that uh, folks in the U.K. are relatively better situated uh, from the standpoint of long-term care. So kind of thinking about what are the pain points for people with respect to their financial plans? Those mm. are the things that we want to be diving into. That's a great way to tee up my next uh, topic that I really want to delve into into with you um you sent me a really lovely email um before the, yesterday i think or the day before basically saying that you're on your pre-timement trip and 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 you're um you know you'd love to talk about your your personal um journey and what and your thoughts which we will absolutely get on to but the, the end of that um paragraph that you sent me and, and i'm and th this quote i'm going to nick it and i'm going to put it in stuff and i'm going <laughs> to Obviously, I'm, I'm going to say that you said this, by the way, um, but you said, and this is from someone who spent the last 20 odd, 30 years thinking about this right deeply. Uh, you put, the more I know about retirement, the more I believe that the financial angle hogs way too much of the discussion. Um, and I, I think it's such a powerful thing to do because I suppose my first question to you, and, and this is baked in a lot of the work and research that you've done is around blind spots and and as you said getting real world information data from real investors real retirees real people and understanding their blind spots is, is is crucial to kind of then coming up with material and solutions and conversation points to be able to help them think about this so very long-winded way of saying to you what what do you think are some of the biggest blind spots both from a financial or numbers point of view and a non-financial human point of view um, that you've witnessed and that you understand about when it comes to people and their retirements? Yeah, it's it's a good question. I would start with the financial piece. And um, I think 2022 provides a, a good case in point of some of the, the blind spots that can come up and bite people where, um, you know, just a confluence of of unexpected and unexpectedly bad events where you had very high inflation happening at a time where um, I think globally we had some interest rate increases that uh, depressed bond prices and we had uh, stock markets globally also struggling. So I think people need to think about the the shocks that can uh, happen to their portfolios and how they would recover from them. Um, one thing with with 
bull markets or bear markets, I should say, is that um, many older adults do come into retirement with very equity heavy portfolios because it's been, you know, generally a pretty good place to be over the past several decades and indeed over long periods of time. And people kind of forget that there will be periodically these uh, market sell-offs. And meanwhile, they're however many years older. So, you know, when you're in drawdown mode and you see your portfolio shrink and you see your spending necessarily have to go up to help help you keep pace with inflation, those things feel different than when you were still working and not drawing from that portfolio. So I think that a um, lot of different blind spots for people to explore, for their advisors to explore with them, where, you know, potentially you simulate some of these scenarios or look back to 2022 and just discuss how the the portfolio losses felt. Uh, would a more conservative portfolio structure make sense? Um, really thinking through the different uh, things that can happen to the portfolio. And then there are sort of exogenous spending shocks that can happen as well, where um, people might not be factoring in, well, what if I have an adult child who suddenly needs me to pull from my portfolio to help him or her? Um, how would I respond? Would I have the liquidity in my portfolio to respond without imperiling my my portfolio's future success. So kind of troubleshooting, thinking through what are some of those spending shocks that might occur? Do I live in an older home that needs constant care and feeding? I'm someone who does live in an older home and I'd want to factor those into my retirement plan um, because they can be quite meaningful. Yeah, yeah. I think... Um... Natixis N- N- just or, or recently um, sent out and their, their global retirement study, and it it, it gives a indication of the top ten retirement mistakes that that people make, and it, it really goes into the blind spots that that you're talking about. Um, at number one, forty nine percent of people underestimate the impact of inflation. Um, forty six percent of people underestimate how long they're going to live for. Forty two percent of people overestimate investment income. Um, I think you know what what we're saying here. Actually, some of the blind spots around, um, and we and kind of we call it the sequencing risk of return and inflation. Um, I think are some of the biggest blind spots that that, that I see. It, it's some of the biggest mistakes. They under people underestimate the impact of inflation and the need to be able to retain future purchasing power. Um, they underestimate actually the real big effect that a bad sequence of return can have on their portfolio. And, and by that, drawing money out of a portfolio really early on and that portfolio is falling in value. Um, and, and ultimately, the, I think there's a longevity education issue here. People are just, you know, it's they don't realize the stats behind what's going on with with our longevity have you got any nuggets or anything that you can pull out around uh, around that specifically around you know sequencing risk of return a bit about inflation and and, and longevity because i think they all actually pretty much sit um and 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 mingle in with one another in in terms of the conversations and thoughts that that people have Definitely. Um, sequence risk is, you know, one of the problems that we need to address when we create retirement plans where you're thinking about, so what happens if bad markets occur early on in your retirement? And the problem is, if you haven't planned for a potentially bad sequence, is that you're spending too much from a portfolio that's simultaneously dwindling. And so there's less of that portfolio in place to recover when the market eventually does. If that bad market environment occurs when I'm, say, 87, it matters a lot less than it does if it occurs when I'm 64. Mm. So really educating clients uh, about the importance of planning for sequence risk is is crucial. And, you know, I think you have two main tools to combat, combat sequence risk. One would be you're thinking about, well, could you rein in spending 
in that period. And if you can, that redounds to the benefit of the financial plan. So could you could you cut spending if that bad market environment material materializes early on? And could you draw upon safer assets? Have you set aside safer assets so you're not having to draw from the stuff that has declined the most? I think yeah. those are the two key aspects of um, mitigating sequence of return risk. Inflation yeah. is something that all of us, I, I believe, got quite complacent about Agreed. in the in the period leading up to COVID, really, where we had. Uh, you know, a couple of decades, really, of very, very mild inflation. It was sort of a non-issue. And then all of a sudden, inflation uh, reared its head and it hit retirees especially hard because they are, um, you know, not necessarily getting a paycheck adjustment to help them keep whole with inflation in contrast to working folks who typically get at least some cost of living to help preserve their purchasing power. If you're retired, it's really on you to address the inflation risk with your plan and make sure that your portfolio, if, if you're drawing a portion of your cash flows from that portfolio that you've embedded some inflation hedges into that portfolio. So have you uh, a decent allocation to stocks, which over time has been the best way to outlag inflation. It's by no means a direct hedge mm -hmm. against inflation. So 2022, perfect example, inflation yeah. was up, the market yeah. was down. Yeah. But over longer periods of time, stocks are a pretty good inflation hedge. And um, then, you know, you might also think about some types of inflation protected bonds, which I believe are available outside the U.S. as well as, well as in the U.S. Those would be the couple of the main things that I would mm. think would be in the toolkit as a mm. mitigant for inflation risk. Just kind of staying there for a minute. Um, I, I know you've you've written extensively and talked about kind of a bucketing approach to a kind of a retirement income strategy, and it's absolutely one that we subscribe to as well when we think about um, where assets should sit. You know, and, and in what buckets, i.e., do, do you have a, we call it kind of a sleep at night bucket, we have a spend with freedom bucket, and we have kind of this long term uh, bucket. And, and those first two are very much around segmenting time. So they're more short term and they're more cash orientated because they need to see you through downturns. You need to spend money on the things you really want to spend money on and not worry about. Uh, when the markets go down, affecting those decisions from a behavioural point of view, um, I'd love to just get your thoughts on that in terms of thinking about that. How people can start to think about their assets when it comes to mitigating some of these risks around inflation and and bad sequences of of markets. Yeah, I'm a big believer in the bucket or time segmentation approach as well, and I always have to credit my interest in that in the whole idea. Uh, to Harold Avensky, who's a financial planner, um, largely retired, uh, was a also a professor of financial planning at Texas Tech. And I remember I met Harold probably, uh, it's been almost 20 years now. And uh, at that time, yields were quite low in the U.S. And so I think the complexion of, well, how do you create retirement income was very much, I, I was examining it. Like if people do not have the organic income from their portfolios. How do you structure a retirement portfolio? And I remember talking to Harold and he said, well, basically I, you know, manage a long-term oriented sort of uh, balanced portfolio for my clients, but I also bolt on this liquidity bucket where they have their liquid reserves set aside for maybe a couple of years to provide them with, with cash flows. And the idea was to help tied them through a bad sequence. If the long-term portfolio wasn't per performing well, well, we, we leave it undisturbed and instead pull from the cash bucket. And I, I remember talking to Harold because he, he said, you know, on these bad, in bad market environments, I'll call my clients and just ask them how they're feeling about the 
declines we've seen in their portfolio. And he said, I practically hear them repeat it back to me what I've told them about this cash bucket, which is that, no, I'm fine. I know I have my cash bucket. And that means I can still go out to dinner with my friends on Saturday night, or we can still plan that cruise or, you know, plan to take that cruise with the family that we planned two years ago because we have set aside this liquidity bucket. So I'm not worried about the long-term piece. Hmm. And to me, that is just a beautiful thing from a behavioral standpoint where you hear something that really gives clients peace and gives them a sense that they can have that, the things that they can const that constitute quality of life for them, hmm. that they can have those things because the portfolio is structured as it is. So I began with Harold's blessing, I should say, began writing about, well, how do you do this bucket strategy? How do you set up your own bucket bucket approach? And I really think that it has a lot of appeal for people um, who really want to hold more volatile long-term assets, but also have that peace of mind that I think is absolutely crucial during retirement. Yeah. And and I think this is definitely, as, as you said, um, couple of minutes ago this has definitely come more into vogue as it's now on the individual to generate this right go, go I, i'm unfortunate enough to never have uh, and uh, never never been benefit of saving into a db or final salary pension so everything's now at my mercy and so go back a generation you know this stuff wasn't really thought of that much right because people had a final salary or defined benefit pension that give them a set level of income that was somewhat inflation protected uh, if not entirely. And and so it wasn't on them. They'd done their work, they'd saved their money, they've got their income, they live their life. Um, the responsibility now of a modern day retirement is so much on the individual. Um, and, and, and I think that's where this bucketing approach really comes into its own to go, actually, I have a framework and a system with what with which to adhere to now, which means that I'm I'm more confident that there's something there to and a plan to 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 to, uh, to be able to execute this. Yeah, Dan, I couldn't agree more. And I often say, you know, when I'm speaking to groups of advisors, like even if you don't use buckets yourself, you probably use some more sophisticated uh, mm. system for managing client portfolios, or you may use some more sophisticated system. I think just as a client illustration tool, it's super powerful to show them, you know, to take asset allocation, which I think can seem really black boxy to people who aren't steeped in this stuff, to say, okay, here's what I'm recommending in terms of your allocation. And basically, here's why, and here's how it connects to your spending and, and your plans, what you're telling me your spending plans are. Yeah. So I, I love bucketing as, at a minimum, an illustration tool for clients, but I think it's fine for people yeah. to use as a way to structure portfolios where you're kind of using portfolio spending and anticipated portfolio spending as the building block that you use to structure the rest of the buckets. Yeah. A uh, key thing there, Christine, absolutely. And, and anyone that's listening, that's thinking about this, this is about connecting your money with your life and giving your money purpose. You know, understand whether you've got some money in the US or the UK or Europe or bonds and equities is, I mean, it's, people don't connect with that, right? But what they will connect with is, okay, there's a sleep at night fund that I know is for that purpose. There's a, I've got this amount of expenditure sitting in that bucket that's designed for the new car I need to buy in a year's time and the um, the holiday that I want to go on for my 60th birthday and the £10,000 or dollars that I want to give to my daughter for her wedding, right? The connect, give, and I think one of the biggest things that I see where people are really calm and successful when it comes to spending and living in retirement is when their money has purpose. It has a job and it isn't just sitting there in one thing and it's allocated. It, it's kind of, you know, it has these purpose and has these jobs. And, and, and I think that's really important for people to do. Connect your money with your unique situation and the job you want that money to do. Yeah, no, I love that, Dan. And I think that it's, as you say, it's really important to take the portfolio and connect it to actual goals and human mm -hmm. plans. It's, yeah. it's absolutely crucial. One thing I'll say about the bucket approach from a 
kind of an investment standpoint is I felt like I spent a good decade kind of running around defending it because it is, it's a behavioral strategy. It's mainly appealing from a behavioral standpoint, but then 2022 arrived and it's like, okay, I don't, I really don't have to defend this thing from an investment standpoint anymore because here we have a great example of when it would have been a bad idea to pull from either bonds or stocks because they both fell at the same time. And of course, that doesn't happen a lot. But I think cash having that liquidity bucket was worth its weight in gold from an investment standpoint uh, in 2022, in addition to the behavioral benefits that we've been talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, If we move on to kind of longevity, I actually think this plays into the non-financial or human elements of blind spots as well, right? We, you know, I think there is a financial element to this. We, we, we are underestimating how long we're going to live. There are, you know, statistics now out there that, that present um, some pretty compelling evidence that we need to plan for the 100-year life Um, if not beyond soon. So, you know, our money needs to last us longer. That's a financial challenge. But actually, I think when it comes to thinking about longevity, there are lots of human elements to this, Um, i.e., you know, if we are doing things in our retirement that give us purpose, that build social connections, that continue to do these things, the research around that's making us live longer uh, as well. Um, And I know you're pretty passionate and you've written about this about, maybe the need to think about continuing to work in your uh, in your retirement and that's a very kind of human element and a human decision to to make right absolutely um this pre-retirement pre-retirement concept that we were talking about earlier dan uh really relates to some research that t row price did it's been it's been a decade now but the basic idea and i've heard this repeated by by people like jamie hopkins not that he was piggybacking on their research specifically, but, you know, for people with tighter financial plans with respect to retirement, one of the best things that they can do is to continue working um, and leave their portfolio undisturbed. Maybe they're pulling back a little bit from saving because they want to have some experiences that they anticipate they'll have in retirement, but have them a little bit earlier. So maybe you take that big trip with the family or something while you're still working that three week trip and it might be expensive. So you don't save as much that year, but the greater good is that you're not pulling from that portfolio. It's continuing to grow. And importantly, you're continuing to earn a paycheck. And so I do think that um, from a financial standpoint, certainly with respect to longevity, working longer can be a, uh, you know, a win, win, win. The key thing is just if if you do have a tight plan, I get worried when I hear people say, well, my plan is to keep working because it's uh, a worthy, as, as my friend and colleague Mark Miller says, it's a worthy aspiration, but it's not a plan, right? Mm, You can't assume that you'll be necessarily be able to continue working. There are a lot of things that force people out of the workforce earlier than they may have expected. Um, Personal health, spousal health, parental health, ageism is a thing in our culture. I think you need to be aware that you may not be able to continue to do the job, even though that's the the thing that might really work for you from a financial standpoint. So that's the financial piece. And then Mm. there's a lot to be said about the other benefits that we derive from work. Um, the, the relationships, the connections that we have with colleagues, a little bit of physical activity, even if you're an office worker, if you're going into the office, if you're, you know, walking yeah. somewhere every day. Um, and, and then obviously the, the sense of purpose that many of us get, out, get from our jobs. Those are all things that can't be weighed and measured in, in the way that the financial piece can be. But uh, I think they're, they're even more important. A bit like the quote or or, or what you said in your email and what I said earlier on about, you know, the the more that you know about retirement, the more you believe that the financial angle hogs way too much of the discussion. The more that I learn about retirement every day by speaking to clients and people like you, um, the, the more that I learn, the more that I truly believe that working solves a lot of problems. 
It solves a lot of financial problems and it solves a lot of human problems. And I think it's not, we need to, as much as we need to redefine the word retirement and what that actually means in a modern day and modern society, when you get into your mid fifties, early sixties, I think we also need to redefine what the word work means to us. It doesn't mean a, unless you want it to be, doesn't mean a six o'clock on the train commute slog, but this is about doing things now that um, you can, um, maybe you've always wanted to do, maybe you've never had the opportunity, but you can leave, you can, you know, you can have a transition from your current uh, career into something else. You can find purpose and meaning through other work. Uh, Work doesn't always have to give you financial reward, right? You can feel like you work and it's just for the passion and the purpose if you don't need to earn money from it. Um, I think if we flip that on its head, you know, work solves a lot of problems. If, again, if the retirement plan is tight, then earning a play check can be really important to feel like you've got some freedom, um, as well as retaining, as you've said, the purpose and the social connections um, and everything like that. So I, I, I do think, you know, people need to be much more intentional about exploring continuing to work because I do believe now and and, and I've definitely seen um, aspects of this over here with my clients I'm working with the the workplace organizations and corporates now I think are much more open to continuing to have experienced um, successful people on their books uh, for two days a week than lose them completely I think they know that these people can add huge amounts of value by having 30 years worth of experience, mentoring the next generation, um, doing stuff to help them. They're much more open to having those part time and allowing them to work a bit more on their terms than they've ever been. I don't know whether you you might have kind of heard that anecdotally as well. Yeah, no, 100%. I think that people need to kind of think broadly about work. And you're right, it, ne- it needn't necessarily be remunerative work. It could, could be some sort of unpaid work. But the basic idea is that you're thinking about those key benefits, whether financial or non-financial, and thinking about whether some activity that you're committing yourself to can bring you those things. I will say, um, and I know you know Carl Richards as well, Dan, But um, Mm -hmm. we were talking to Carl. We've had him on our podcast several times. Uh, I think it was during peak COVID or maybe at some point later on. And Carl made this point, which I think it actually came from some other individual, but he's like, create a stop doing pile, basically, Mm -hmm. like create a stop doing list, things that are part of your job that you don't love. Well, just sort of take a mental note of those things. Can you find a way to offload that stuff? Mm -hmm. And how much happier could that be in your work life? So I think that there are some creative tricks that people can think about to, um, you know, think more broadly about work. Work doesn't have to be the job that you're in. Um, and if if work for you is some sort of inexorable slog, don't do it. That's not mm. healthy for anyone. It's uh, maybe healthy financially, but it's, it's not a great idea. Think mm. about other variations of work that could bring you some of those same benefits. But I love that idea of people really stepping back and brainstorming. I know you do that with your clients, helping them think about well, what is your next act? Um, and we tend to see, I, I have heard that men sometimes struggle with some of these, replacing some aspects of work when they retire. So I think men especially need to think expansively about like, what am I doing on a day-to-day basis? And literally maybe map it out, um, you know, I, okay, from nine until 10, I'll go to the gym and whatever else, kind of map out your days, uh, maybe even take some some vacations to sort of experiment with what that actual retirement might feel like. And and you might decide that continuing to work should be some component of that. Mm, Great advice. Yeah, no, absolutely brilliant. Um, Could not, could not agree more. And and, and again, some of the most popular exercises that we do with people um, in our retirement planning playbook that we get them to kind of work through and think about is around constructing their days. What does their, what does their, what do their weeks look like? What do their days look like? What are they retiring to? Too many, too many people focus on what they're retiring from and they don't actually think that the two bit. 
Um, so I think it's, yeah, it's really important to, to start to plan that and as, and and sooner the better right start to and, and you said Carl, Carl's brilliant he comes up with some great things um and he reframes things that he's heard in a in a really clever way but that kind of you know do more of the things that you love doing and less of the things that you don't like doing try and get on a journey to that and that might take a couple of years but get get on that get on that journey um i really want to i, I want to um move to your impending book that's coming mm. out that I'm um, it's the ultimate retirement geeks tease because you've got this book. It is sounds amazing. It's entitled how to retire 20 lessons for a happy, successful and wealthy retirement. Yet it's not out until September. So I don't <laughs> know. I mean, it, that, I mean, you've got the front covers out. There's the little thing, the blurb, and I'm like, I really want to read this and I can't at the moment. Anyway. Um, but I'd really love to just to touch on those because the bit of digging that I could do on it, um, I think there are some really interesting things that we can bring to the forefront here. So you've literally wrote the book on the subject, How to Retire, 20 Lessons for a Happy, Successful and Wealthy Retirement. Can you talk to me about some of those lessons? Can you give me um, what you think are some of the um, most important things that people can, can take out of the, um, the, the conversations you've had to write that book? Yeah, sure, Dan. And thank you for mentioning it. It's uh, been a labor of love. It's been a project, um, but <laughs> it's actually a series of interviews with thought leaders in the retirement planning space about how to do some aspect of retirement. And because as we've discussed, I think that retiring well is both financial and non-financial. The lessons are both financial and non-financial. So um, the idea is that I'm talking to individuals like Wade Fow, who is a big thought leader in a lot of different aspects of retirement planning, my former colleague, David Blanchett, uh, talking about some of his research on spending, um, talking to people like Ramit Sethi, who's one of my favorite people to interview. It, Ramit, in contrast with most of us who are very much engaged with talking about how to save and invest, Ramit is, talks about how to spend well and how to make sure that you're not just spending in line with what everyone else is doing but in in fact that you're spending in line with what really gives you joy mm. so it's been a a fabulous set of conversations and i've been spending time just really distilling the interviews into um something that you know is is a little more readable and uh you know doing some organization around the margins but mm. um it's been a really fun project and a fun learning experience. And my hope is that the 20 lessons will be uh, really relevant for people, advisors and uh, yeah. certainly individual investors as they think about their retirements. Can I pick on a couple? Cause I've, I've sure. managed to, I've managed to kind of, again, I've, don't know how I've, I've got on the on the dark web and I've managed to find some of this <laughs> stuff. Right. But I think that, you know, you've, you've teased and released some of this, but um the, the, there's a couple of uh, human ones, right? And, and again, I, as much as I think, you know, we, we, we understand the numbers and I know and Wade's been on the podcast um, and talked about retirement income styles. I've had a conversation with David Blanchett about coming on and thinking about um, thinking about that. So I think, you know, Wade's done the retirement income styles. We know that that's a really interesting lesson. We know that spending changes in retirement. You know, I think there's a lot of, um, I've, I've, I've interviewed a few people about that. What I'm really interested in is, is a couple of bits that I come across. Um, one is spending to optimize happiness. I think that's, a, again, right in my wheelhouse because that's what we encourage people to do. And the other one is live life so you have no regrets at the end. Um, a lot of people that I start to work with often say something along those lines it's kind of i'm coming to work with you because i don't want to look back and regret or i don't want to look back and go i wish i would have done that can we pick on those two things to spend five minutes or so on that because i think your, your thoughts on that would be hugely beneficial yeah so spending um in line with what brings you happiness i mentioned ramit sethi was my go-to expert on that topic and um one point that i loved that he made in the interview was that if you're doing it right you're going to make some choices where people will be sort of saying huh 
that's kind of, that's weird. And so, you know, one from my own life, for example, I, I would say is that I do not care about cars at all. I do, I drive a bit, but I do a lot of walking. And But anyway, I'm fine with like a minimalist car, frankly, a car well below what I think I could afford. Um, so, I, you know, I've often wondered, what do my neighbors think that I drive this? <laughs> I'm about to get an upgrade, but I drive a 2012 Honda Accord, which is like a very serviceable serviceable vehicle. I could, you know, get three, four passengers, whatever. But so that's a choice that I make, um, which is just not to allocate to the automobile side of the ledger. My husband, on the other hand, really enjoys cars. So he'll always have a good car. Uh, you know, something that really lights him up. That's a good use of funds for him, not for me. So I loved that Ramit, uh, you know, made the point that if you're making the right choices, you will probably not fully conform with what society might expect of you. Um, and so the, the point was, as we think about retirement, really think about what are some of those choices you might make? What are the things that a lot of retirees seem to do that you really don't mm -hmm. care about? Um, so I loved that discussion. And um, what, uh, the other one about Jordan Grummet, uh, who I interviewed about not having regrets. Jordan is a um, medical doctor, now uh, a hospice doctor, where he works with patients at the end of their lives. It sounds like a terribly glum topic, but Jordan's point and really uh, something that runs throughout his work is I spend a lot of time with people at the end of their lives. They have regrets about things that they wish they had done. Don't wait until the end of your life. Do these things, ideate about these things earlier on. And one, one key point that Jordan makes is people don't regret things they tried and failed at. So the person who tried to trek Mount Everest or climb Mount Everest didn't regret that they tried and they didn't make it for whatever reason due to weather or their you know, whatever, that, that their breathing wasn't strong enough, whatever the case might be, they regret that they never even tried to do that journey if that was really on their list of things they wanted to accomplish. So that's actually the last chapter of the book. I've spoken with Jordan um, numerous times over the years, and uh, it never ceases to move me, his passion for helping people think about, uh, you know, what are the things that you might regret at the end of, of your life. Some of the the things that Jordan talks about are what he calls, he said, he, his, his phrase is uh, purpose paralysis, that people are, you know, think that they need to embark on retirement, that they have these really giant goals, like, oh, I need to start, start a foundation for pediatric cancer or climb Mount Everest or whatever it might be. His point is, we all have small p purpose as well. So maybe it's like being a great partner to your spouse or and or um, maybe it's uh, uh, being the glue in your family among your siblings, that you're the person who really brings everyone together, that those small p purposes are actually just as important as the big p purposes. So don't get paralyzed by purpose paralysis that, uh, you know, if you're thinking about some smaller things that are important to you, those are just as valuable. It's such wonderful, wonderful advice. I've said it a couple of times on this podcast, right? Most podcast players have this like 30 second rewind thing you can hit and it goes back, right? Um, everybody listening, just hit that a couple of times, go back a minute, 30, two minutes and just listen to that. Because I think there's so much wisdom and, and I'll just bring that to life a little bit, right? Um, I wrote a couple of weeks ago about how we as humans um, like to operate in relative terms and we need to get away from that. We need to go absolute, right? We need to go, well, actually, what matters to us? And we shouldn't play up to this. You know, if driving a, a, a functional car is right, but everyone expects you to drive the big car, don't, don't worry about relative. Spend in absolute terms. And some of that might seem extravagant to some people, and some of it might seem really lowbrow to others. But work on your own terms. So I think that is number one, right? That, that's such a fundamental thing. Um, 
I had my wonderful client, Neil Jones, as a guest on the podcast to talk about his retirement journey. And I, and I got him on, he was six weeks into it. And I was like, I'm really interested just to hear your thoughts. And he said something on that podcast that stuck with me massively. And like you said, Christine, this idea that when we hit retirement and we've got this time, we have to plan things and think of grandeur stuff, big trips, big this. I said, Neil, what are you enjoying the most? He said, I tell you what, Dan, walking the dogs and having a pub lunch with my wife is transformational, right? It costs 20 quid. I walk down the road with no baggage on my shoulders because I'd have to worry about thinking about work. I can do it on a Sunday afternoon. I'm taking the dog and we sit down and we talk over a pub lunch. He said the simple things are making such a big difference, right? So I think that that's so huge as well. And my last point is about regrets. We don't, if, if we don't plan this properly, the only thing that we're going to leave on the table is memories and experiences. It, it, forget the money. I mean, we know all the stats out there and you've published papers, Christine, about the amount of um, money left on average on, you know, retirees simply on average just get don't get through anywhere near the amount of money they would expect to get through during their retirement lifetime. And the problem with that is that you, you're just leaving memories and experiences and some regret on the table. A hundred percent. And Dan, I have an anecdote to share along those lines. A college friend of mine, um, we used to ride on the same train line. He lived in the adjacent town. We would uh, often have lunch, uh, ride on the train home. And he was an attorney and loved being an attorney, loved the law. We'd often talk about the law and, you know, sort of Supreme Court cases and so forth. Um, but he worked really hard. So whenever I was on a late train coming home, oftentimes from going out with friends or whatever, he was there too, schlepping home at, you know, 8 p.m. or whatever the case might be. And um, the last time I saw him, he told me that he was going to retire. This was, I think, two years ago. And he's a couple years older than me, but he was retiring fairly young. And he said, I realized I have enough money and the main thing is that the I just love riding my bike to the library. Like for me, that is quality of life, that I don't need that much. And um, sadly, I got news um, from a mutual friend uh, just a few months later that he had passed away very suddenly of, uh, I believe it was an aortic aneurysm. Um, it had retired for, for a few months or a, perhaps a year, but um, really uh, had not given himself enough of a runway. I don't, I'm, I'm afraid. Uh, he had a career that he really enjoyed, but had not given him, given himself enough time to pursue those small joys. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, I would say for people who are working still or thinking about retirement, whatever, just make sure that every day, and this sounds like super preachy, but I'm a big believer in like micro joys. Like don't just think that, don't come into retirement with all kinds of pent up demand. Make sure that every day you're finding ways to, you know, to observe small amounts of, of joy. That's something that I try to try to internalize and try to live. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. And I think for every success story you hear, there's probably more of those, right? More of those stories where people leave it too late, eventually get on the path, but the path is very short. And um, I think we can all, you know, we, we can all resonate with that. Um, Christine, as we wrap this up, it's been such a wonderful, wonderful conversation. I've got one more question I'd love to ask you um, uh, um, bef before we, um, bef before we hit, uh, hit stop. Um, you're pretty well versed in this stuff, right? So you, 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 you've spent a long time talking about or, or dealing with portfolios and investing. You spent a, a big bulk of your career about um, the kind of the human element of this stuff as well. Um, yet you have a financial planner, right? We do. Uh, uh, my husband and I have a financial planner. Yep. And she's um, fantastic. So it's a loaded question. I know it. But if if you're working with a financial planner, then that means pretty much everyone else <laughs> should work with a financial planner. Why do you believe you should work with a financial planner on this stuff, particularly around retirement? Well, retirement planning is just incredibly complex. I often think that people come into retirement 
thinking about the accumulation years where in my view accumulating for retirement is pretty straightforward it's save enough have a sane asset allocation that uh you know is, is fairly equity heavy and then have some sort of buffer asset set aside to protect yourself against some you know unexpected thing happening in your life retirement is a whole different ball game where you're you know, you need to calculate what is a safe spending rate. You need to think about how to position that portfolio to protect yourself against um, some of the risks that we talked about earlier. So there's just the, simply the complexity of retirement. Tax planning is a huge reason that my husband and I have a financial planner because we have been lucky enough to have some company stock um, and there are some tax vagaries in the U.S. that have made it relevant for us to, to get some advice about how to try to reduce those positions, but to do so tax efficiently. So the tax piece has been super important for us. And then, you know, another thing is just something to keep us on track. So we, um, you know, our saving is on track and automated, but just to have someone on a regular basis tap us on the shoulder and say, hey, you know, let's sit down and meet. Let's look at your portfolio and, um, you know, just just make sure that this jibes with whatever your plans are currently, because mm -hmm. we get busy. We don't necessarily have time to do, to do that money date or, you know, to spend the time with our portfolio. I sometimes feel like the cobbler's uh, child, you know, or the, the cobbler where, um, you know, I attend everyone else's portfolio, but yeah. my portfolio sometimes doesn't get the attention. So, yeah. um, yeah, we are big believers in getting uh, financial planning advice. We pay, uh, an hourly planner, um, which is the right model for us because the, our need for advice is kind of episodic, but, mm. um, I would urge people to think about getting at least some element of advice as they embark on retirement, because this is not for Sunday drivers. It's not an easy process. And there are a lot of different moving parts. Mm. It brings us full circle back to the thing about blind spots, right? I mean, it's, mm -hmm. The definition of blind spots is they're blind. And just because you're, you, you know, it doesn't matter how expert you are in a field, just by being you, you're going to have blind spots. And if you have outside help, no matter what that is, they can hopefully see those blind spots. So, um, yeah, I think, I think you're absolutely right. Look, Christine, this has been such a, an amazing conversation. Um, in the show notes, I'm going to link a, uh, link to your book so everyone can pre-order it i think we can pre-order it now right love it um yeah and uh your website the podcast um there was a really good guest from the uk on it a couple of months ago so you know <laughs> go and have he a listen was to that amazing. one <laughs> um but it just leaves me to really say thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your pre-timement trip to to join me and and talk about this stuff i, I know it's going to add so much value to everyone listening well, Dan, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and an honor to be on your podcast. I've, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, really appreciate that. And uh, just leads me to thank everyone once again for joining us on the Humans versus Retirement podcast. Until next time, take care.